Hello again, everyone. I hope you're all hearing me well. I am uh, Rami Zureik, and I am the interim director of the Palestine Land Studies Center. And it is uh, a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor to welcome uh, today uh, Professor Joseph Massad uh, from Colombia, who is uh, our uh, speaker for the day. Uh, before I introduce formally Dr. Uh, Massad, I am going to, uh, uh, I would want to say a couple of words about uh, the, uh, the Palestine and Studies Center. And uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind us all that the PLSC has got a, a lineage. The Palestine Land Studies Center was founded at the American University of Beirut in 2019, uh, based on the archives of uh, Professor, uh, of Dr. Pardon me, Salman Abu Sitta, who uh, is uh, who is the founder of the uh, Palestine Land Society, which is uh, a, a charity that is established in in the UK. And, and who has spent a lifetime gathering archives and producing material uh, that is relevant to, to the land and the people of Palestine. The center's core values are, are around the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, past, present, and, and future, specifically the right of return. And, uh, uh, it also, uh, it, 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 its main purpose is to produce, uh, um, to produce uh, knowledge around uh, the past of Palestine, the present in Palestine, and the future in Palestine, specifically on the relationship between land and people confronting settler colonialism. And it is around these general themes that uh, I am extremely happy to welcome uh, today uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joseph Massad. Dr. Massad is, uh, is a distinguished uh, uh, academician. He is uh, a professor currently in, at Columbia University. Uh, he is the author of a large number of uh, books, and uh, I'm uh, eagerly waiting to hear his uh, his uh, lecture today. So please welcome Dr. Joseph Massad. Joseph. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Zureik. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm uh, happy to be uh, giving this lecture, the title of which is uh, Jewish Self-Determination in the Land of the Palestinians. Um, and I suspect we will be able to take questions afterwards uh, from the attendees. Um, last month, the Anti-Defamation League, one of the most fanatical pro-Israeli U.S. organizations, issued a report reiterating the relatively novel definition of Zionism as the movement for self-determination and statehood of the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland, the land of Israel. I'm quoting. As the ADL tells us, quote, anti-Zionism rejects Israel as a legitimate member of the community of nations and denies the right for Jews to self-determination and to establish a state in the land of Israel. Uh, the ADL report concludes, and I quote again, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic in intent or effect. Not to be outdone, the director of the Turo Institute on Human Rights and the Holocaust, Professor Anne Bayevsky, goes further when condemning the recent report issued by the United Nations Commission of Inquiry of Israel last week. Likening the UN to the Spanish Inquisition, Bayevsky asserts that the inquisitors, and I quote her, the inquisitors decided that the murder of six million Jews who didn't have self-determination and the protection of a Jewish state were irrelevant to the UN inquiry into Israeli violations of Palestinian human rights. It seems, according to Bayevsky's logic, that not granting Jewish colonists in Palestine Jewish self-determination has now become the primary cause of the Holocaust. And indeed, 
that it is the Holocaust which explains, if not justifies, the ongoing Israeli violations of the Palestinians' human rights, which presumably is why Bayevsky faults the UN Commission of Inquiry for ignoring it in its report. Bayevsky concludes, and I quote her again, that this UN inquiry and its creators, enablers, and mandate holders are bent on the demonization and delegitimization of Israel and the self-determination of the Jewish people, the face of modern anti-Semitism. These are hardly new lines of argument, but they acquire special importance in the wake of the 2018 Israeli basic law, the so-called nation state law which stipulates that, quote, the land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people in which the state of Israel was established, and that, quote, the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people in which it fulfills its, its natural, cultural, religious, and historical right to self-determination. And finally, that the right to exercise national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people, unquote. But it is not only Israel and its Israeli and U.S. lobbying organizations that deploy the term. So do pro-Israeli U.S. academics, as does political scientist Michael Walzer, for example, who claims outlandishly, not to mention anachronistically, that the outcome of the Zionist establishment of the Jewish settler colony means that, and I quote him, today, Jewish self-determination, impossible for almost 2,000 years, is an everyday fact." Unquote. The Europe-based International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, whose definition of anti-Semitism has been adopted by the US and the EU, also insists that, quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, example by claiming that the existence of, a state, of the State of Israel is a racist endeavor, unquote, is a form of anti-Semitism. Unlike these recent Zionist claims, the indigenous Palestinians had put forth their claim and right to national self-determination since the end of World War I, when that right was introduced internationally, beginning with Palestinian appeals to the Paris Peace Conference, a right the Palestinians continued to invoke in the face of ongoing British and Zionist denials since then. The increasing use by Israel of the so-called right of Jewish self-determination as having always been foundational to the Zionist movement and to Jewish settler colonialism in Palestine, and as the basis for denying Palestinian self-determination, is, however, and as I will show, belied by the historical record. Whence then came the question of Jewish self-determination as the principal argument deployed by Israel, its laws, and its U.S. allies and academic marketers against the right of the indigenous Palestinians' right to self-determination? The term first appeared in Hebrew as a translation from the Russian as, quote, the right of self-definition, or in Hebrew as hazichut lehagdara'at smit and began to be deployed during the terrorist war that Zionist militias launched against the British mandatory authorities from the early 1940s through 1948. Not unlike the rise of the concept among South African white colonial settlers following the Boer War with the British, and, and of course, which led to the establishment of the Union of South Africa in 1910 as a British dominion with white self-government, European Jewish colonists began to use self-determination in earnest when they parted ways with their British sponsors. Zionist ideologues, since the inception of their war against the Palestinian people, did not, however, argue for Jewish self-determination, but rather sought to delegitimize the indigenous Palestinians' right to it. In the tradition of all colonial powers, who denied that the colonized were a nation, the Zionists began with denying the nationness of the Palestinians while affirming the then recent Zionist invention of Jewish nationness. The denial of the nationness of the Palestinians would lead to the denial of their right to self-determination. Embarrassed as a self-identified socialist Zionist that the Zionist project was denying the indigenous Palestinians the right to self-determination, the leading Zionist colonist Yitzhak Ben Zvi, who later became the second president of the State of Israel, argued in 1921 that only the Bedouins among the Palestinians were actually of pure Arab racial stock. 
I'm quoting him. The rest, of, the rest of the natives were simply peasants and urbanites that did not make up a national grouping, unlike presumably the European Jewish colonists who issued from a motley of European and non-European countries and who, in his opinion, did uh, constitute racial stock and a nation. These arguments, of course, were identical to those made by the British and the French to prove that the Egyptians, Indians, and Algerians did not constitute nations. For Ben Svi, the Palestinian natives were, and I quote him again, the Palestinian natives were, quote, Arabs in language and culture, but by origin and race are mixed and composed of different elements, as is proven by its national, religious, and racial composition. The population of this country is not of one national character and will not constitute a single nation, an enemy of the Jewish people as a new nation in the country. On the contrary, this population is composed of different religious and national groups, each of which has a more or less definite national character." Unquote. Ben Tzvi asserted, as would David Ben-Gurion also, that the Palestinian peasants were in fact descendants of the ancient rural Hebrew Jewish population who later adopted the language, culture, and religion of their Arab conquerors. It is unclear if intermarriage with Arab Muslim conquerors and the resulting miscegenation might have been the operative criterion for him to deny them their collective national identity. The Zionist organization argued that based on biological descent or the fantastical anti-Semitic claims that Jews have across history formed one race and shared one blood, rendering them one people and one nationality, European Jews have a claim to the land of the Palestinians. This was the argument that the Zionist organization, the legation to the Paris Peace Conference presented, but without ever invoking a Jewish right to self-determination. Their claim was, and I quote it, that the land is the historic home of the Jews, and through the ages they have never ceased to cherish the longing and hope of a return, unquote. The way the Zionist organization constructed the argument is, is through tracing its claim of biological heredity to the ancient Hebrews, and that the Hebrews, as alleged progenitors of modern European Jews, were allegedly in exclusive possession of the right to the land over all of what had become mandatory Palestine, which the Hebrews had transmitted to modern Jews through the bloodline. Zionism's project was thus to claim European Jews' right to the land of the Palestinians based on this Christian and later anti-Semitic and now nationalist claim of a common blood among all Jews, whom the anti-Semites accused of being Asiatic, Semitic, and not European. These theories, of course, were elaborated by race theorists like Houston Chamberlain or Elgin During. Uh, and others, which you know, many of the founders of Zionism, such as uh, 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 Herzl, uh, uh, Max Nordau, Arthur Rupin, uh, would read uh, uh, and learn from uh, concerning precisely the, you know, the issue of the racial makeup of European Jews. In contradistinction to the Zionists, the Palestinians have always invoked their right to the land as the basis of their anti-colonial claim against Zionism. This was the case since the inception of the Zionist threat, especially following the Balfour Declaration, which crucially was issued by the government of Lloyd George, who was actually a champion of self-determination, but only in the former German settler colonies. It is most interesting to note in this regard that unlike the post-mandate use by the Zionists of the concept of self-determination, Neither the Balfour Declaration of 1917 nor the Palestine Mandate employed the language of rights, let alone of the right of self-determination for the Jewish colonial settlers, even as they were granting them the land of the Palestinians. Whereas some Zionists claimed that Palestinians lack common descent as they share blood and ethnicity with other Arabs and even non-Arabs, and therefore lack particularity as a Palestinian nation. This was Ben Svi's argument. Others like Vladimir Jabotinsky were willing to concede the right of the Palestinians to their own land, but explained that such a right was in conflict with the colonizing Jews superior because allegedly historical and ancient right to the land, which created a hierarchy of priorities. The priority to the rights of the colonizing Jews was established through a right of conquest, 
based on a theory of alleged origins and historical longevity, not to mention that as modern Europeans, colonizing Jews were developing the land which lay fallow in the hands of the natives. Jabotinsky conceived of the issue in European supremacist terms. I quote him, a civilized Jew immigrates to Asia in the same way that a civilized Englishman immigrates to Australia. He transports Europe within himself to the land of Israel and contributes to the development of the 2000 year old European heritage, which is close to his heart, absorbed into his blood. To our neighbors in Asia, we wish the same thing, the liquidation of the Orient as fast as possible." Unquote. This was also David Ben-Gurion's early reasoning about the matter. In 1924, he explicitly referred to the Palestinians' own right of self-determination. Let me quote him. The Arab community in the country has the right of self-determination, of self-rule. It would never occur to us to restrict or minimize that right. The national autonomy which we demand for ourselves, we, dem we demand also for the Arabs. But we do not admit the right to rule over the country to the extent that the country is not built or is not built up by them and still awaits those who will work it. They do not have any right or claim to prohibit or control the construction of the country, the restoration of its ruins, the productivization of its resources, the expansion of its cultivated area, the development of its culture, or the growth of its laboring community." Unquote. In a letter to the British Assistant Under Secretary of State, Sir John Schockberg, in March 1930, Hayim Weizmann, the head of the Zionist organization, invoked his opposition to Palestinian self-determination, affirming that, quote, the rights that the, Jews pe that the Jewish people has been adjudged in Palestine by the British mandate do not depend on the consent and cannot be subject to the will of the majority of Palestine's present inhabitants, unquote. Weizmann, Weizmann was clear that when the British promised the Zionists a national home in Palestine, quote, the agreement of the Palestinian Arabs was not asked, unquote. The reason for why Palestinian consent was of no import, Weizmann added, was on account of the uniqueness, as he put it, of the Jewish connection to Palestine. He further claimed that as Arabs were being granted self-determination in neighboring states like Iraq, they could not be allowed to stand in the way of Jewish colonial aspirations in Palestine. The Palestinians themselves could not, quote, be considered as owning the country in the sense in which the inhabitants of Iraq or of Egypt possess their respective countries, unquote. To grant the Palestinians self-determination or, or self-government or, quote, a legislative assembly would be to assign the country to its present inhabitants and to cancel, and I'm still quoting, and to cancel in an underhanded manner the Balfour Declaration's commitment to a Jewish national home in the land of the Palestinians. Meeting in the Biltmore Hotel in New York in May 1942, the Zionists issued their infamous political program for the final takeover of the country of the Palestinians. Attended by 600 American Jews and 67 foreign Zionist Jews, including Weizmann and Ben-Gurion, the conference program asserted the following. I quote, in the course of the last 20 years, the Jewish people have awakened and transformed their ancient homeland. From 50,000 at the end of the last war, their numbers have increased to more than 500,000. They have made the waste or they, might, they, they have made the waste places to bear fruit and the desert to blossom. Their pioneering achievements in agriculture and in industry, embodying, embodying new patterns of cooperative endeavor, have written a notable page in the history of colonization. The program further called, and I quote, for the fulfillment of the original purpose of the Balfour Declaration and the mandate, uh, and the mandate, which recognizing the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine, was to afford them the opportunity, as stated by President Wilson, uh, this is Woodrow Wilson of the US, to found there a Jewish Commonwealth, unquote. The Biltmore program did invoke the rights of Jews to immigration and settlement in Palestine, but not to self-determination. The Zionist movement has often argued that establishing a Jewish state for world Jewry 
was a moral and historical necessity that must be protected and enshrined in law, something it tirelessly pursued over the decades. However, ironically, the language of rights was never employed by the main documents that Zionism generated, nor the ones it obtained from world powers until 1948. The Zionists would argue more recently that Zionism was nothing less than the movement of Jewish national liberation, or even more recently still, for Jewish self-determination, and that the Jews of Palestine sought independence. All three notions that were in fact absent from Zionism's major documents all along. In his two foundational texts, The State of the Jews, or Der Judenstaat, and The Old New Land, Alt New Land, Theodor Herzl, the father of Zionism, never invoked the notion of Jewish rights to argue for a state of and for the Jews, whether in Palestine or in Argentina, the other, of course, the other location that he had proposed. Herzl did speak of a solution to the Jewish question, but not of a right. And neither did the Press Zionist Congress, Congress Herzl convened in 1897 and the Basel program it issued cite such a right. This also applies to the three international foundational texts that Zionism worked hard to bring about. The first such text, the Balfour Declaration, rather than use the language of rights, of rights used the language of affect, promising that the British government, and I quote, views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a Jewish national home, and that its declaration, the British Declaration, was, quote, a declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, unquote. This was followed by the mandate for Palestine issued in 1922 by the Council of the League of Nations, which based itself on the Balfour Declaration and also did not recognize any Jewish rights to a state or even to Palestine. What it did recognize was, quote, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine as the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. Again, asserting like the Balfour Declaration before it, that this should not prejudice the rights of non-Jews. So when rights were mentioned, there were the rights of non-Jews, uh, but there were no rights for Jews as such that were mentioned in the Balfour Declaration or in uh, uh, the mandate document. The third and, made, and more major text, the November 1947 United Nations Partition Plan Resolution, proceeded from a moral preamble, namely that the General Assembly considered, quote, that the present situation in Palestine is one which is likely to impair the general welfare and friendly relations among nations, and hence the need to provide a solution to what the resolution called the problem of Palestine. Unlike these Zionist and international foundational documents, which did not employ the language of Jewish rights, the Zionist movement insisted on its use in its own foundational document of the state, namely Israel's so-called Declaration of Independence, which in fact is formally titled the Declaration of the Establishment of the State of Israel. The declaration signed by 37 Jewish leaders, 35 of whom of course were European Ashkenazi colonists who came from Plonsk, from Lodz, from Poltava, from Pinsk, from Kaunas, while the remaining two were a Yemeni and a Moroccan Jew. The, all 37 leaders included only one signatory, namely Bechor Shalom Shetrit, who was born in Palestine to a Moroccan colonist family that arrived in the 1880s in the country. The declaration, which however never mentions any Jewish right to self-determination, misinforms us that, quote, in the year 1897, at the summons of the spiritual father of the Jewish state, Theodor Herzl, the first Zionist Congress convened and proclaimed the right of the Jewish people to national rebirth in its own country. Notice it uses the word right. But as the documentary record shows, however, neither Herzl nor the Zionist Congress proclaimed such a right at all. The Basel program stated clearly and simply, and I quote, that Zionism seeks for the Jewish people a publicly recognized, legally secured homeland in Palestine, unquote. Yet the 1948 Zionist Declaration proceeds to tell us the following, quote, this right, or this alleged right, was recognized in the Balfour Declaration of 2nd November 1917 and reaffirmed in the mandate of the League of Nations 
which in particular gave international sanction to the historic connection between the Jewish people and Eretz Israel and to the right of the Jewish people to rebuild, to rebuild its national home. On the 29th of November 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. The General Assembly required the inhabitants of Eretz Israel to take such steps as were necessary on their part for the implementation of that resolution. This recognition by the United Nations of the right of the Jewish people to establish their state is irrevocable." Unquote. As none of these documents had affirmed such a right at all, indeed that the idea that any people should have a right to a state does not even exist in international law, the imputation to them that they did falls more in the realm of a Zionist investment in the new language of international relations within which the notion of rights became enshrined after World War II, not, not least in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights issued seven months after Israel's declaration. Israel's declaration of the establishment of the state is so invested in this mode of argumentation that it, it invokes the European Enlightenment's notion of natural rights when it asserts in its preamble that, quote, the right to a Jewish state is the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations in their own sovereign state, unquote. The framers of the declaration conclude that, quote, by virtue of our natural and historic right and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, we hereby declare the establishment of the Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the state of Israel. Now, it's important here to point out that the logic of this document is in its insistence that its invocation of the Jews' right to establish a Jewish state in Palestine has a clear legal and moral genealogy of which it is merely the conclusion and that such a right was finally granted irrevocably by the partition plan. That none of this was true did not deter the colonial settler framers who in asserting a right they arrogated to themselves were now instituting a mode of argumentation that would be the most powerful rhetoric in establishing Israeli facts on the ground. Excuse me. Nonetheless, as is clear from these foundational texts, what was being invoked is not the so-called right of the Jewish people to self-determination, but rather the right of the Jews conceived as a nation by turn of the century Zionism and anti-Semitism, and as a race whose bloodline is traceable to the ancient Hebrews, to the land of the Palestinians. This is important to point out since the ADL declaration with which I began this lecture, that it is not the right of Jewish self-determination, which anti-Zionists deny according to the, AD, to the ADL, but rather the exercise of Jewish self-determination in the land of the Palestinians, which they, the ADL calls the land of Israel, and not even the state of Israel. It is important also for Michael Walzer's claim, which asserts that the Jews, through a direct bloodline going back to the Hebrews, had been denied Jewish self-determination for a whopping 2,000 years. The declaration of the establishment of the state of, of the Jewish state was named as such after proposals to name it Declaration of Independence were turned down by the Zionist leaders. It was the Zionist Communist Party delegate, Meir Vilner, who proposed that the state be declared sovereign and, excuse me, and independent. But this amendment was turned down. He even proposed that the Jewish People's Council uh, that declared the state explicitly state its support for the right of both peoples, the Palestinians and the Jewish colonists, to self-determination and to independent states of their own. But these proposals were rejected outright in favor of declaring the state Jewish and nothing more, and without mention of any people's self-determination. The reasons for rejecting terms like independence had to do with the main purpose of Zionism, namely that their state would be the state of the Jewish people worldwide and not only of the Jewish colonists in Palestine. Declaring the state independent and sovereign would have implied that it was independent of world Jewry, 
and therefore that it was an Israeli rather than a Jewish state. In view of Israel's leaders' insistence that the Zionist movement continue its settler colonial activities, even though a Jewish state had been established, as the majority of Jews remained outside Israel, the question of independence might have precluded it from doing so. Such reasons would be made explicit in subsequent debates about the refusal to call the state independent officially. <clears throat> Moreover, the name to be given to the Jewish state was coined late. It was on May 12, 1948, two days before the state was declared. The debate about what to name the state preceded the partition plan, but no decision had been made despite the many proposals, which included Judea, Zion, Yeshurun, Eber. The name State of Israel was accepted in April and officially adopted on May 12th by a committee that included the Belarusian colonist uh, David Remes and uh, Bechor Shitrit, the aforementioned Bechor Shitrit. The choice of what to name the state is said to have been first proposed by the Ukrainian colonist Aharon Shemshelevitz, later Reuveni, the brother of Yitzhak Ben Tzvi. <coughs> Calling the country the state of Israel or Medinat Israel, where in Israel the name given to the biblical Jacob after he struggled with the angel of God refers to the Jewish people, Jacob's descendants, was a deliberate choice. The coiners refused to call it the land of Israel, as that would be confusing, since the state until then was going to be established only on part of the land of Israel. The name of the state would facilitate the Zionist tarnishing subsequently, or even then, of anyone who opposed the state of the Jewish people with anti-Semitism um, in the decades to come, and as the ADL recently reiterated. The more recent deployment of the so-called right of the Jewish people to self-determination and the so-called state of the Jewish people neatly follows the same logic. On 30th November 1947, the day after the UN General Assembly passed the partition plan, the Zionists set out to conquer all territories granted them in the plan and then some. Zionist expulsion already theorized by Herzl in the late 1890s and planned by Weizmann, Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion and others since the 1920s and 1930s was put into action. The Jewish Agency, which was the main Zionist organ in charge of advancing Jewish colonization of Palestine, had set up its first population transfer committee in November 1937, after the British Peel Commission recommended expelling a quarter million Palestinians from areas the Peel Commission report designated for the colonizing Jews. The transfer committee's mission was to strategize the forceful expulsion of the Palestinians. A second transfer committee was established in 1941, and a third during the Zionist conquest in May 1948. Uh, the problem with the Zionist expulsion plans was that unlike the 1937 British Peel Commission report, which called for expulsion of the Palestinians and takeover of their lands, and which the British government ultimately rejected, the 1947 UN partition plan forbade both. If the Peel Commission wanted private and public lands stolen and populations expelled, the UN partition plan proposed to divide only state lands between the Jewish colonists and the Palestinian natives, giving the colonists who by then constituted 30% of the population, 57% of the land. Uh, it also, of course, stipulated that the city of Jerusalem would become a corpus separatum or a separate body under UN jurisdiction. But unlike the Peel Commission, the UN plan explicitly forbade confiscation of private land and the expulsion of populations. The Zionists accepted the UN partition, except that they violated all its precepts and treated it as if it were an expansive version of the Peel Commission report, but now ratified by the United Nations. The partition plan stated clearly that, quote, no discrimination of any kind shall be made between the inhabitants on the ground of race, religion, language, or sex, and that, quote, no expropriation of land owned by an Arab in the Jewish state or by a Jew in the Arab state shall be allowed except for public purposes. In all cases, I'm still quoting from the plan, in all cases of expropriation, full compensation as fixed by the Supreme Court shall be said 
previous to dispossession. Unquote. When the Israeli declaration of the establishment of the state of Israel was issued, Zionist forces had already expelled about 400,000 Palestinians from their lands, and they would expel another 360,000 in the coming months. From this, it follows clearly that not only is Israel's claim to establish a Jewish state that established demographic majority by ethnic cleansing was not advocated by the partition plan, but that it was in fact in violation of it and was rather authorized by the recommendations of the rejected Peel Commission report. The proposed partition plan on which Israel based its establishment initially um, envisioned a Jewish state with an Arab majority, which the plan later modified slightly to include 45% Arab population, and therefore it never envisioned the Jewish state as ethnically cleansed of Arabs or Arab In 1946, the population of Palestine was under 2 million people, or more exactly 1,972,000, of whom 1,364,000 were Palestinians and 608,000 mostly Jewish colonists. According to the plan, the population of the Arab state would consist of 818,000 Palestinian Arabs and less than 10,000 Jewish colonists. The proposed Jewish state would consist of 499 Jewish colonists and 438,000 Palestinian Arabs. Now, had the city of Jaffa with its, with its 71,000 Palestinians been included in the Jewish state as the United, as, as the United Nations uh, uh, Security Council, uh, or rather as the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, which had originally proposed partition, uh, uh, had wanted, the Palestinians would also have outnumbered Jews in the Jewish state. In the UN Corpus Separatum of Jerusalem, which lay outside the two states, um, it included 105,000 Palestinians and 100,000 Jews. So, in fact, Palestinians outnumbered Jews in all three areas until the final exemption of Jaffa from being part of the Jewish state, which reduced Palestinians there to about 45,000 to, to about 45 percent um, of the population. As Palestine was divided into 16 sub-districts, nine of which were located in the proposed Jewish state. Palestinian Arabs were actually a majority in the 15 of the 16 districts, uh, and had the enclave of the city of Jaffa continued to be included in the Jewish state, they would have been a majority in all 16 districts. In none of the 16 districts, let alone in the nine designated as the Jewish state, did the Jewish colonists own a majority of the land. In fact, uh, aside from uh, Haifa and Tel Aviv, in which they owned uh, more than 30% of the land, they owned less than 1% in the majority of the rest of the districts. The Zionist movement understood the contradictions of the partition plan well, and based on that understanding, it set out to expel most of the Arab population in accordance with the Peel Commission's recommendations. The Jewish colonists' subsequent deployment of the concept of independence rhetorically even though they rejected it as a legal category for their state, was a precursor to the subsequent deployment of the so-called right of Jewish self-determination. It is in this vein that the 1948 declaration and the preceding Zionist terrorist war against the British and the Palestinians would be referred to in Israel and outside it, both as a declaration of independence or also as the war of independence. In the Jewish terrorist campaign against the British between 1944 and 1948, which is how the British government described it, 44 to 50 Jews were killed, compared to 338 Britons, a ratio of 6 to 1 in favor of the Zionists. As historian Walid Khalidi put it, and I quote him, this is an unheard of ratio in the annals of colonial warfare between the regular army and rebels in all wars of independence. Unquote. Nonetheless, as the age of decolonization was blossoming after World War II, Zionist propagandists sought to integrate themselves as anti-colonialists in fighting Britain in a manner not unlike how the Boers, let alone white American colonists, saw themselves as fighting British colonialism. The conquest of the territory of a prospective Palestinian state, however, presented a problem when Israel submitted membership a membership application to the United Nations 
on the first anniversary of the partition resolution 181, while it remained in occupation of Palestinian and UN territories. The Security Council reviewed the application and adopted resolution 69 on 5th March 1949, recommending that the General Assembly admit Israel as, quote, a peace-loving state. The vote was 9 to 1 at the Security Council in favor with only Egypt opposing. The United Kingdom abstained as it had done on Resolution 181 in 1947. The General Assembly, however, was reluctant to admit Israel until it responded to queries regarding its violations of two United Nations resolutions. This related to Israel's refusal to declare official boundaries, its occupation of half the territory allocated to the Palestinian state, its occupation of West Jerusalem, which was designated as UN administered, and its refusal to allow Palestinian refugees to return to their homes inside the territory on which Israel established itself, along with its refusal to compensate the refugees for lost property, as stipulated by the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 194. Resolution 194 also established the United Nations Conciliation Commission on Palestine, which during this period was negotiating with Israel on the demarcation of its borders. Israel's ambassador, the South African-born Aubrey Solomon, who later known as Abba Even, responded to the queries on 5th May 1949. He assured the General Assembly that the matter of Israel's boundaries could be resolved through a process of peaceful adjustment, as he put it, of the territorial provisions laid down in the Partition Resolution 181, and that the adjustment, and I quote, the adjustment should be made not by arbitrary changes imposed from outside, but through agreements freely negotiated by the governments concerned. Uh, Abba even added that the refugee problem could not be settled before the issue of borders is settled through separate negotiations with each Arab state, and that Israel would not be able to nego negotiate effectively without first becoming a member of the UN. So rather than satisfying the UN resolutions based upon which it would be admitted to the United Nations, he argued that in order to satisfy these UN resolutions, Israel has to be admitted first. On Jerusalem, uh, Abba even stated that Israel would have favored UN jurisdiction were it not for the Arab state's, quote, armed resistance and the refusal of the United Nations to take control of the area. He clarified that Israel would cooperate with the UN uh, to establish control over all the holy places in the city, which, of course, most of which were in Jordanian-occupied East Jerusalem at the time. Based on these assurances, the UN General Assembly admitted Israel as a member on the 11th of May 1949 by a 37 to 12 vote adopting a res Resolution 273. But the resolution stipulated that Israel must abide by Resolutions 181 and 194 as a condition of its admission. Nine countries, including the United Kingdom, abstained. Of course, based on this, uh, legally, today, one could question the legality of the admission of Israel at the UN, since it remains in violation of two resolutions stipulated in the very resolution that admitted it. But neither the Security Council nor the General Assembly resolutions made any mention of Jewish self-determination, and this is very important. So as re they recognized Israel, they did not recognize the right of Jewish self-determination. The next day, the United Nations Conciliation Commission on Palestine held a conference in Lausanne, attended by Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, during which Israel refused to repatriate or compensate the Palestinian refugees and proposed to annex all the territories it occupied illegally as a form of bilateral territorial adjustment. The Arab states rejected this as they understood that the Israeli, quote, proposal involved annexations rather than territorial adjustments. Excuse me. <clears throat> Indeed, Israel considered the territories it conquered from the projected Palestinian state and the United Nations territory of Jerusalem as part of Israel, even though the only international document that granted Israel any form of legitimacy were the boundaries stipulated by the General Assembly Resolution 181, of which it remained in violation. 
This is why, despite increasing pressure from the United States, Britain was adamant not to recognize Israel, arguing that it would only do so after the frontiers of the state shall be clearly defined. This led the U.S. representative at the U.N. to argue that when his country gained independence in 1776, quote, the land had not even been fully explored and that no one knew where American claims ended and where European state claims began, unquote. It would seem that white European settler colonies are the same, whether established in the 18th or in the 20th century. British de facto recognition of Israel would only come on the 30th of January 1949, but it took place as a result of hard bargaining with the U.S. The U.S., under Zionist pressure, had refused to recognize Jordan's independence from Britain in May 1946, as the Zionists were not fully determined or decided at the time on how much of Jordan they might want to conquer as part of the Jewish state. The British, however, needed to protect their client state and its leader, King Abdullah, who had reached an understanding with the Israelis to keep the eastern and central parts of Palestine that his British-led army had captured at the end of the war. Later that year, on 5th December 1949, Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion unilaterally annexed West Jerusalem and declared that Israel was no longer bound by Resolution 181, not only with regards to the Palestinian territories it had conquered, but also with regards to UN control of West Jerusalem. France introduced a motion at the UN to censure Israel, most likely on account of its, of its missionary interests in the city. The UN General Assembly issued Resolution 303 four days later, declaring that Jerusalem would be placed under a permanent international regime. Israel rejected the resolution and on 14th December moved Ben-Gurion's offices and the Knesset from Tel Aviv to West Jerusalem, where Ben-Gurion declared, and I quote, Jerusalem has always been and always will be the capital of Israel, unquote. Britain finally recognized Israel de jure on the 27th of April 1950, while still voicing its reservations on the question of borders, including Jerusalem. France, which had provided arms to the Zionists in the late 1940s and the French loan to Israel in 1950, did not upgrade its legation in Israel to an embassy until September 1952. The Zionists never justified any of these conquests or annexations by appeal to any right of Jews to self-determination, but insistently on the Jews' so-called historic right to the land based on their alleged bloodline as heirs to the ancient Hebrews. Since its inception, the Zionist project to colonize Palestine has been determined and uncompromising in its colonial settler goals, but at the same time, it demonstrated ideological innovation and acrobatics in packaging its takeover of the country of the Palestinians. While the initial goal was to create a colonial Jewish majority in Palestine, successfully achieved for a few decades through the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in 1948 and again in 1967, Zionists have more recently had to face the old new reality of Jews as a minority in their own colonial settler state. This is where the question of Jewish self-determination and explicit claims of Jewish supremacy became necessary again to assert Zionist colonial claims. In the 1970s, when the PLO insistently called for the Palestinian people to realize their right to self-determination, which Palestinians had been demanding since 1919, Israel countered with a so-called, and I quote, Israeli self-determination, read Jewish, of course. This was expressed in September 1972 by Israel's foreign minister, Abba Ibn, who declared that, quote, Israeli self-determination should take moral and historical precedence over Palestinian self-determination, though it does not rule it out entirely, unquote. Abba Ibn's recognition harks back to the assertions and statements by uh, Ben-Gurion and Hayim Weizmann since the 1920s, uh, which placed the Jewish right of conquest of Palestine as superior to the Palestinians' right to self-determination. In the meantime, pro-Israel U.S. academics began to market Zionism 
uh, since the 1960s and increasingly in the 1980s as an anti-colonial movement and even as the movement of national liberation of the Jewish people. The latter claim was propagandized by none other than the Tunisian Zionist Albert Memmi, uh, which was, this is all a novel expression, of course, uh, I mean, the issue of, of self-determination and national liberation, um, which were engineered to efface Israel's colonial settler nature, which the Zionist movement, ironically, never denied previously. In recent decades, the Israeli government has been obsessing about the dwindling numbers of Israeli Jews and the rising numbers of Palestinians. Its strategy in the last 20 years to alter these demographics by increasing Jewish immigration and the Jewish birth rate and reducing the Palestinian birth rate have proven a complete failure. It is in light of these demographic realities that Zionist and Israeli propagandists began to speak increasingly of Jewish self-determination rather than Israeli self-determination, as Abba Ibn had done in the 1970s, when Israel was still successful in camouflaging its Jewish supremacist character, but only, of course, to Western liberals. If for Zionist leaders, Jewish or Israeli self-determination took precedence over Palestinian self-determination between the 1920s and the 1970s, which is why the Zionists would never allow the Palestinians to exercise it. Today, the Palestinians, as the Knesset declared in 2018, have no such right at all. And if uh, they did uh, have such a right, the Jewish right to Palestine has become exclusive and unique and continues to take precedence as Abba even affirmed. The new law, however, does not signal a change in Zionist or Israeli policy. As I've demonstrated, nothing stipulated in the 2018 basic nation state law is novel ideologically or in terms of any of the policies Israel and the Zionist movement pursued since the 1920s. It should be noted that the law's reference to the land of Israel rather than to the state of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people which was, with which the recent ADL reaffirmation is fully congruent, anticipates the Jewish colonial minority's control over the whole of historic Palestine and is fully in line with the expansionist foundations of Israel in 1948 and why the country uh, could not then be named Eretz Israel. The ADL, US academic marketers of Israel, Israeli officials, all trot out the so-called Jewish self-determination right as superior to Palestinian self-determination in order to safeguard the Zionist colonial project and Jewish supremacy in Israel, which many of them support unapologetically. The hypocrisy, however, lies with American and European Jewish and Christian liberals, let alone their Israeli Jewish counterparts, who feign shock over the nation state law and last week's elections, which brought Benjamin Netanyahu and his Zionist religious allies back to power, and whom Western liberals consider somehow as more Jewish supremacist than Ben Gurion, Hayim Weizmann, Abba Ibn, or any of Israel's other leaders. Dalia Schneidlin, a US political scientist, published a column in the New York Times last week, heralding the collapse of Israeli democracy, as she put it. She is most worried about Israel's recent illiberalism, which, according to her, started in 2009 when Benjamin Netanyahu came to power. She avers that, quote, the apex of this illiberal legislative frenzy was the nation state law of 2018, a new basic law elevating Jews to a higher status than all other citizens, unquote. But Jews had already had a higher status ensured by Israel's declaration of itself as a Jewish state in 1948 and legally beginning with the law of return in 1950, the law of absentee property also 1950, the law of the state's property 1951, law of citizenship 1952, Israel's land administration law in 1960, the construction and building law of 1965, and so forth and so on, not to mention the appeal to the priority of Jewish colonial rights over Palestinian indigenous rights, as articulated by Ben Gurion in the 1920s, Weizmann in 1930, or Abba even in 1972. 
the invocation of Jewish self-determination in the land of the Palestinians since the 1970s has been the major camouflage to embellish the reigning regime of Jewish supremacy in Israel. However, neither the 2018 nation state law nor the new Jewish supremacist government of Israel signals a change, major or minor, in the status of Jews or Palestinians in Israel and its occupied territories. The only change they augur is the explicitness of Israel's ongoing commitment to Jewish supremacy, but without any more embellishment. The panic this has induced in Israeli and pro-Israeli US and European liberals is that no amount of repetition of an appeal to the notion of Jewish self-determination can any longer undo this explicit Israeli commitment to Jewish supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I, you know, I, I had to hold myself from clapping and I am sure many in the audience, if not all the audience, uh, feels exactly the same. Joseph, uh, you know, uh, my description of you would be uh, encyclopedic knowledge and sharp critical mind and, and, and you know, a, a fabulous and innovative look into the past, the present uh, and giving a glimpse of the future. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, voyage that uh, Rami, you, you are most generous, Rami, most generous. No, no, that's absolutely true. But, and by the way, you know, for those of you who who uh, do not uh, uh, know uh, uh, Joseph and who might uh, not uh, have uh, read completely the uh, you know the poster uh, that I use, I wanted to say that uh, among you know, aside from the men. That, Many prizes that uh, that Professor Masad got, uh, and uh, the the tens of books that, that he has written, uh, starting with uh, Desiring Arabs, and then uh, a forthcoming book that appears to me to be extremely interesting: The Age of Independence, a Settler Colonial History of the World, uh, like a broad spectrum, which I think is very much needed at this point. Uh, uh, Professor Masad is, is also a very prolific op-ed writer, and I do follow him, and, and I would very much recommend uh, that you, uh, you know, you, 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 you know, you actually do so. I think his latest in the electronic intifada on the, the Western liberals was a gem in its own right. So thank you also, Joseph, for writing these things as well. I would like to, to, uh, to, to open the floor uh, to questions, please, could you use uh, the chat uh, uh, he, that we have and uh, uh, address it to, to everyone, if that's possible? Uh, I would be uh, most uh, most uh, happy to read them to uh, to Joseph. So while we, we, you know, people get uh, around uh, writing, I, I have a question, Joseph, that has been uh, sent to me uh, on on my on my WhatsApp. So I'm going to ah, read it to you. Okay. And uh, uh, and uh, and the question is the following: You know, if the Zionists are attempting to argue that most urban farmer Palestinians are not truly Arab in in some sense, are they not somewhat admitting that the country itself is Arab, or at least that Arabs have a greater claim to the land than the largely European Zionists? Um, uh, no, not really, of course, because um, a Zionist claim is, of course, uh, uh, is borrowed from other European colonial claims. When France invaded Algeria or when uh, Italy invaded Libya, they both claimed that they were returning to the lands of the Roman Empire and that the Arab inhabitants uh, of North Africa were the actual conquerors, while the French settlers and the Italian settlers that were being introduced were actually returning to their ancestral lands. So the Zionists would take actually that idea and run with it. So claiming that, first of all, that they are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, 
and true that this was the land of the Hebrews, the Arabs were conquerors and who were living in that land, and that uh, basically the European Jews were returning to the land of their ancestors. Right? So in that sense, um, whether the Palestinian natives were considered Arab or a motley of different racial stock, it didn't really matter. Right? And in this, in this way, it's not unlike what the British claimed even about uh, Egypt or the French about Algeria, that the population did not constitute a nation or a people, but a, a bunch of tribes, a bunch of uh, ethnicities and religions. Remember, Churchill said um, India can no longer can, can, can no more be considered a nation than the equator could. Right. So the idea that you know colonized nations did not or colonized countries and populations did not constitute nations was a time honored uh, European colonial claim. The Zionists, as I always remind my audience, are terribly, terribly unoriginal in anything they proffered. They usually are very good and assiduous. Uh, uh, students and followers of European colonists, and they borrow many of their arguments and they just reiterate them and they repeat them in a Palestinian context. Okay, uh, I have, uh, I am going to read uh, from uh, 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 a question by, by Professor Sari Hanafi, who is uh, with us here and who's also a member of the steering committee of the Palestine Land Studies Center. And uh, he says, Hello, wonderful, talk. <laughs> wonderful talk, dear Joseph, uh, question. More and more of the, there are writings about the religious nature of the current Zionism. I am thinking of the to recent word of Nadim Ruhana. Uh, to what extent this is also related to the past, i.e. to what extent uh, Zionism is at the same time a secular and the religious movement. Fascinating, fascinating question. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Sari. No, of course. I mean, as um, I mean, as many scholars have already pointed out historically, uh, I mean, Zionism has always, you know, had secular. At least the majority of the founding Zionists had a secular claim to make, but also at the same time used the uh, uh, sort of the, the the biblical scripture as both both a book of history and a book of geography. Um, of course, the early Zionists did have a couple of religious groups uh, as part of the Zionist organization. The first one the, was the uh, Mizrahi group, what they called the Mizrahi, not the Mizrahim, of course, uh, which referred to the uh, Merkaz Haruhani, which was a, a religious Orthodox uh, a group in Eastern Europe, uh, and you know they they, they used the acronym uh, of the Merkaz Haruhani, which became Mizrahi, or Mizrahi as they pronounced it, and they joined based on a religious claim to Zionism. The other group, of course, was uh, Agudas Israel, who were non-Zionist, later would, you know, would be pronounced in the Hebraized uh, pronunciation of Agudas as Agudat Israel. They joined, but only in so far as they sought to live in Palestine, but not necessarily to support uh, the Zionist effort. Now, aside from these two groups, of course, which were explicitly religious, the majority of the founders, while not religious, relied on all these religious criteria. The idea uh, suddenly that Jews lived in exile, which is a biblical idea, that the Jews of Europe were not, in fact, uh, 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 later converts to Judaism like Christians were. They accepted the anti-Semitic notions, of course, that European Jews originated in Palestine, but somehow European Christians did it's unclear since both populations converted to these two foreign Palestinian religions. Uh, but, past, but European Christians never thought of themselves as descendant of the early Christians of Palestine, for example. Uh, but they did think, especially the Protestant Reformation, uh, that European Jews were somehow related uh, uh, directly uh, to the ancient Hebrews, which was also partly part of Jewish lore at the time. So the Zionists actually took on these uh, 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 religious understanding that uh, 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 European religious Jews had, that they were somehow living in exile or Galut, that they were somehow the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, um, and that the uh, scriptures, in fact, could tell us about the geography and the history of uh, the Jews. Uh, remember that this is also, but you know, at the same time, 
part of the rise of nationalism more generally. What you have is for the first time in the 1840s, you have the first book uh, uh, that was a, a history book written that talks about the Jews or the history of the Jews from the ancient period until the present. This is, of course, the book by Goetz. Uh, that was a very strange uh, historical book to write about. Imagine writing a book about the history of Christians from the ancient times to the present. Uh, but this was the first attempt to create uh, some kind of a uniformity between the ancient Palestine Hebrews to you know, modern Jews around the world as somehow being one people whose history can be encapsulated in one book. So a lot of the secular movement to create a nationality for Jews, which was of course the project of the anti-Semites, uh, but also adopted by the Zionists, uh, would begin from these religious premises, both Christian and uh, uh, Jewish religious premises. So in that sense, uh, 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 the, the more, you know, the subsequent commitment, especially by the followers of Rabbi Cook, who would become very important, you know, subsequently in the 30s onwards and his son in the 1960s, uh, with the followers in Israel uh, expanding the, the realm of more uh, religiously committed uh, uh, Zionism uh, would build on these Zionist premises. Because remember, there was really no religious Zionism uh, prior to uh, the Zionist movement that existed. The more, the most that you have is in the late 18th century uh, with the revival of Protestant uh, evangelicalism, uh, you also begin to have new messianic Jewish uh, sects uh, forming, uh, the most important of which was, of course, from Lithuania and parts of Poland at the time, called the Perushim. 4,000 of whom would arrive in Palestine at the beginning of the, ninth century, of the 19th century, joining the ranks of the native 4,000 Palestinian Jews who had come to Palestine after the Reconquista in the 15th century in Spain. So by the 1840s, you have now 8,000 Jews living in Palestine as part of about 400,000 Palestinians, 4,000 of whom are native or you know, indigenized Palestinian Jews who spoke Arabic and who originated in Spain, and the more recent 4,000 Perushim who came for religious reasons but did not have a project, uh, a national or a state project. They came for religious reasons. A lot of these Jews who would come for these types of religious reasons in the 19th century as a result of the rise of Messianism and some uh, European Jewish uh, circles, and of course, not to mention among Protestant Christians, uh, would later become Zionized uh, uh, because of this sort of melange of uh, secular nationalism, uh, secular race laws and biology with uh, uh, the understanding uh, in the biblical scriptures of Jews as one people uh, who are now living in exile. So I hope this helps. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Joseph. Uh, I have another question here. Uh, so, Sari, thanks you a lot again for your wonderful talk. But I have a question for, from Walid, and uh, he asked, do you agree and, um, that the strident and fraudulent type uh, assertion of the notion of Zionist self-determination reinforces the notion that Zionism has reached a dead end, and this might give rise to a new Nakba. Um, could you? Um, I can't see the uh, on my chat the question you, that you just asked. Okay, you, you should you should uh, look at chat. Ah, okay, you, now I see it. Now I see it. You don't okay. see it. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, um, that free, I mean, I, I do see it as an interesting development in the language and in, in, in the deployment of the language of rights. Like I said before, you begin to see this actually already in 1948 in the declaration of the establishment of the state of Israel, where suddenly the notion of rights uh, are being, you know, is being invoked and it's claimed retroactively as having always been invoked since uh, the 1897 with the first Zionist Congress, which as I've demonstrated was not actually true at all. The only rights that uh, uh, were ever invoked by the Zionists were in the Biltmore Program of 1942, and it was the right to colonize Palestine. So the right of settlement and colonization. There was nothing about the right of self-determination. They ignored it, even though it was an important component of the debates 
after World War I, especially after Lenin's and the Soviets uh, uh, had advanced their socialist and universal understanding of self-determination. And the Americans, uh, Wilson was very concerned about this communist right and adopted it to only be uh, applicable to the uh, subject people of the defeated empires of World War I, meaning uh, uh, the Ottomans and uh, the Germans. Um, so, uh, you know, so in that sense, it was very interesting, of course, uh, that they did not uh, ignore the notion. The Palestinians and the Syrians were sending appeals, as were the Egyptians, to the uh, Paris Peace Conference, uh, demanding the realization and the, right, the exercise of the right of Palestinian self-determination uh, in Palestine and in Syria at that time. So, um, I mean, uh, they're quite innovative, the Zionists. I, th I think the panic is less about uh, the bankruptcy of the Zionist project as such, but uh, about the, its inability to realize its project demographically. Uh, remember, the majority of Jews who came to live in Israel did not come because they were uh, somehow swayed by Zionist ideology. They did not become Zionist ideologues and join the ranks. Most of them, in fact, most of the Jews who ended up in Israel ended up there because they had no other place to go. Uh, when the Zionists began to propagandize their uh, project, very few Jews came. In the 1920s, for example, the Jews who did come to Palestine, many of them ended up emigrating and leaving. It was after the Nazi Nazis rise to power that you begin to have a huge expansion of Jews immigrating to Palestine and coming in uh, from 1933 onwards, you know, whereas you had before anywhere from, you know, a, a, a few hundred to a few thousand people in the 20s emigrating and then actually leaving Palestine after 1933, you begin to have almost 40, 50,000 people a year coming in, not because they loved Zionism, but because most of the rest of the world, Europe and the US had closed their gates to uh, uh, the increasing uh, uh, Jewish refugee problem in Europe. Um, and remember, these populations were leaving not only Germany, but increasingly anti-Semitic Poland after 1935 and anti-Semitic Romania uh, after 1935. Uh, they tried to come to the US, they were sent back. The Soviet Union took, of course, many um, uh, as refugees at the time. So uh, uh, those who ended up in Palestine were not actually Zionist ideologically, uh, but rather people you know, who uh, uh, left Europe as refugees, but of course arrived in Palestine as uh, colonial settlers, you know, which the Zionists immediately adopted. You see this also again in the situation of Arab Jews after uh, uh, 1948. Uh, many of those Arab Jews who had choice uh, or choices to leave, like you know, Egypt's Jews, the rich ended up in France, the middle class in the U.S. Uh, only the poor who had no choice ended up in Palestine. Um, uh, the story is more complex about Arab Jews because of what the Israeli Mossad had done uh, and the Israeli government had done to bring about their exodus. Uh, but the point being is that the majority of the Jews who ended up in Israel were not actually Zionists. This is a problem today because of the uh, because Jews had become a minority again between the river and the sea. And the Israeli government doesn't know what to do. Its calls on American Jews to come, you know, have not been answered. On uh, Argentinian or French Jews have not been answered. And the last call uh, that brought in a million uh, former Soviet Jews, Russian Jews, turned out to be a problem because the million Jews left for economic reasons. And as the U.S., after the fall of the Soviet Union, no longer allowed them to come to the U.S. as political asylees, they ended up going to Israel for economic reasons, and half of whom turned out not to be Jewish according to Jewish law, as we know. But um, so the issue, again, is, you know, you get, you get economic refugees, political refugees, but not Zionists. So Zionism has actually failed to convince the majority of Jews to move to Palestine. It has been successful in getting the majority of Jews to support the cause of Israel, either politically or financially, but not by moving there. So this is the dilemma, and this is where the problem is today, which is why the 2018 law insists that Jews have an exclusive and unique right 
to self-determination in the land of Israel, not only in the state. So this includes the Golan Heights, this includes uh, uh, the West Bank and Gaza, and presumably would include you know, the Sinai or all of Jordan, because they are also considered by many of these religious Jews as part of the land of Israel. It's unclear what the Eretz, Eretz Israel actually means. Is it from the Euphrates to the Nile? Or uh, it's a biblical notion, right? So uh, in that sense, the law stipulation that they have this particular right in the land of Israel, not only in the state of Israel, uh, uh, is precisely to uh, uh, engineered to obfuscate the possibility of democracy, that it has to be, they have to be a majority for their right to trump the right of the Palestinians. Now we know that they can be a minority, and as a minority, they still have the Jewish supremacist right uh, that is unique and exclusive to them, uh, regardless of what their numbers are. I can't hear you, uh, Ram. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you very much. We have a number of other questions, and uh, we we we, we uh, intended to. Uh, uh, to go on till uh, ha till half past seven, so uh, ten minutes or so from now, but we can extend a little bit. Uh, so the the next question is from Hassan Awar. Uh, so and the question is the following: You have shown us, among many other ideas, a parallelism between the establishment of the Israeli state and the colonial establishment, like Europeans in North America. Now all colonialists are behaving in an apologetic manner, like uh, at the current or recent environmental summit, but Israel is not backing up by any means. When would Israel start to understand to give way, do you think, please? Um, uh, thank you for the question. I, I, I don't actually believe other uh, settler colonies are backing away. The US certainly isn't, Australia isn't, New Zealand isn't, uh, Canada is not. <clears throat> so I, I think Israel is in good company uh, in this sense, right? So it's, it's, it's very important uh, to remember this. Uh, uh, usually, um, uh, sometimes uh, Palestinian or pro-Palestinian activists in Europe or in the US uh, tell us of, you know, why do European or Western liberals uh, support all uh, uh, liberation struggles, but there's a, an Israel exception. When it comes to Israel, they don't support it. It's not actually true. It's not true. When we speak about the ongoing violations of the rights of Native Americans or the First Nations of Canada, most of these white liberals don't support, for example, the liberation of uh, the U.S. from settler colonialism uh, or of Canada or the Maori in New Zealand or the Kanaka Maoli in, 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 in Hawaii uh, from U.S. settler colonialism. Uh, they support them as much as they support Israel. So um, I don't think they're backing away at all. Um, uh, what you seem to suggest is that in the third, in Asia and Africa, there has been a backing away uh, since the 1960s, especially with the independence of Algeria, the subsequent independence in the 70s of Angola and Mozambique, and later of uh, uh, Zimbabwe, which was, of course, Rhodesia, by 1990 of Namibia, and in 1994, South Africa, which of course did not get independence, mind you, uh, this, uh, the, the ANC made a compromise to end political apartheid, but to maintain economic apartheid. So white people continue to run the country economically, but now uh, blacks and the coloreds and Indians can actually vote. But nothing had really changed. Today, as we know, black poverty in South Africa is worse than it was under uh, uh, apartheid, not to mention other horrible sort of uh, markers and indices. Um, so um, I don't believe they are backing away any more than Israel is, actually. Israel is more precarious because it hasn't been able to establish a majority um, uh, uh, over the native population and was unable to kill off uh, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, the, the local population, which they thought, you know, as Ben-Gurion once said, you know, the old will die and the young will forget. Well, that didn't happen, so. That's right. That's right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and, and uh, okay, so I have another question that's also really interesting because it brings about the liberal, you know, and my Bet no nemesis, Bet Noir. <laughs> That's so, such a pleasure. This is from uh, Rana Baghdadi. Such a pleasure, Dr. Joseph. Thank you for this talk. My question, what are your thoughts on the ever-increasing sensitivity among US liberals 
to anti-Semitism and quote unquote anti-Semitism. It seems it is the absolute worst thing a person can be. And uh, it even seems to be worse than being homophobic or racist. Why do you think this notion has a, just has such a strong hold on public and political opinion? And is it just the history and popular memory of the Holocaust that keeps everyone liberals uh, in check? Um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, remember, uh, anti-Semitism uh, as a, as a uh, social attitude and as racism continues, of course, to hold sway among uh, uh, different white supremacists and uh, uh, in U.S. culture more generally, but of course a lot less than it did in Europe. And uh, uh, while more recently uh, American Jews have been victimized by acts of anti-Semitic violence, especially uh, a, few, a couple of years ago in Philadelphia where uh, someone attacked a synagogue and killed uh, several of the worshippers, another attempt in California. So there has been an increasing physical threat to American Jews. Of course, uh, not the, you know it's, it's, that threat is uh, uh, you know much smaller than the violence exercised uh, by uh, Islamophobes against Muslims uh, in the U.S. Not to mention the ongoing uh, racism, uh, uh, especially the ones exercised by the U.S. Uh, police uh, uh, against African Americans who are killed on a daily basis, mostly for being black. But that should not in any way discount the uh, uh, continued uh, you know, horrific existence of anti-Semitism and the actual threat it constitutes, uh, the physical threat it constitutes to Jewish communities. Now, of course, the reason why uh, white liberals are more horrified by anti-Semitism than any other forms of racism, even though its effects are smaller than the effects of anti-Black racism or anti-Native American racism, is precisely because Jews since World War II, um, like other European populations like Italians and the Irish, have become white people. Have become, by the late 1950s, you know, Jews came to be integrated in the US as white people. Uh, remember my own university, Columbia University, uh, had anti-Semitic uh, uh, quota system in the middle of the 19 until the middle of the 1950s for its medical schools for Jewish admissions. Uh, so we're speaking. This is a late occurrence, the late 1950s, when a lot of this kind of institutionalized anti-Semitic uh, policies uh, uh, were abandoned. Um, in the at, you know at, at the same time in the 1960s. Uh, part of the Cold War policy of the U.S. and of Israel was to actually um, uh, uh, make, uh, uh, or, or, you know, basically propagate uh, the horrors of the Holocaust as a totalitarian uh, uh, sort of crime uh, at the same time as they were calling the Soviet Union a totalitarian country and as Israel one was under attack. On the one hand, to say that the US, the Soviet Union and the Nazis were both totalitarian and to bring up the uh, memory of the uh, genocide of the Holocaust um, meant that you could also begin to accuse the Soviet Union of anti-Semitism, which, of course, uh, began to happen because the Soviet Union did not allow many of its Soviet Jewish citizens to leave and immigrate to the U.S. or Israel. And at the same time, uh, this helped Israel. If you attack Israel politically, then you must be an anti-Semite. And of course, this was this was part of the Israeli propaganda line, you know, uh, all along. In the sense that the Zionists felt, and in the a declaration of the establishment of the state in 1948, they said clearly that the world owes them this homeland as a result of the Holocaust. Of course, the majority of Jews who were killed in the Holocaust were not Zionists, uh, which is why they were not in Palestine, they were in Europe, uh, 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 and they were killed. The Zionists actually did not suffer, uh, 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 or Israel itself, or the Zionist movement in Israel did not suffer at the hands of the Nazis, yet they claim the Jewish victims of Nazi Germany as their own. So as a result, the whiteification of Jews, the Cold War deployment of the Holocaust as a weapon against the Soviet Union and against detractors of Israeli settler colonialism uh, came to be integrated in uh, uh, white liberal uh, political culture. Now, of course, they are right to be horrified by anti-Semitism, as all of us should be uh, constantly. Um, however, to again elevate uh, 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 the question of anti-Semitism over and above other kinds of racism is something, of course, that I think is historically based and is part of the ongoing commitment uh, by white liberals to the defense of white peoples more so than others. Um, uh, now, I think, of course, the, the redefinition uh, 
of uh, anti-Semitism uh, and the adoption of the redefinition of anti-Semitism as anyone who questions Israel's right to be a racist colonial settler state is part of the Zionist uh, fear of the ongoing exposure of what Israel is about. Uh, so it became a legal principle in the U.S. or in, well, I mean, you can't really prosecute people for it, but you can deny them funding uh, by the U.S. Congress or by, Europe, by the European Union. Uh, so you, you can no longer, in fact, say that Israel is a racist state without uh, being accused by people who adopt this definition of being anti-Semitic. This is part, I think, of the increasing bankruptcy of Zionism. Um, but remember, this is all along what Israel had done. It called itself the Jewish state. Israel says, we have to conquer Palestine in the name of the Jews. We have the right to conquer Palestine in the name of the Jews. We have the right to uh, oppress the Palestinians, as Bayevsky uh, claimed, because we were oppressed in Europe. So in the name of Jews, we have to do all these things. That is, therein lies the anti-Semitism of Israel. Israel thinks its achievements and its crimes are Jewish crimes and Jewish achievements. The detractors of Israel, including the Palestinian people, believe that Israel's crimes are the crimes of the Israeli government. And Israel's achievements, political achievements, are the achievements of the Israeli government, not of the Jewish people. The anti-Semite here is the Israeli government, who speaks in the name of Jews to justify its crimes. And then if you attack it, it claims that you are the anti-Semite. So it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an easy claim to respond to by showing that it is Israel and those who defend it who are the anti-Semites. And remember, the majority of pro-Zionists in the U.S., are evangelical Christians who themselves are anti-Jewish and want to convert Jews to Christianity. The majority of, of Zionists throughout since the 19th century, and as Theodore Herzl and the Zionist movement had recognized, were anti-Semites who supported Zionism because like the anti-Semites, Zionism wanted to empty Europe of, of Jews and take them somewhere else. So it seems to me that usually the majority of anti-Semites uh, fill the ranks of Zionists, not of anti-Zionists. The majority of anti-Zionists are on the left, they support third world liberation, and they are part of the anti-racist movement. Now, some anti-Zionists anti may be anti-Semitic, but certainly they are minuscule uh, in the movement, whereas they are the majority uh, amongst the pro-Zionists. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph, do we have time for some more questions? Are you I'm, okay happy to take, I'm happy to take more questions. Okay, well, we have a, another question here uh, uh, from uh, uh, Bandar Saeed, and, and, and he says that an edifying talk, Professor, as always, the Zionist state seems to have made overtures to Arab uh, Jews in the Gulf recently such as the formation of the Association of Gulf Jewish Communities. What is the role of such overtures in the context of Jewish self-determination? In other words, what is the purpose of these moves when the majority of these Arab Jews would refuse to migrate to the Zionist state in the first place? Um, it's unclear, in fact, what the number of Jews on the Gulf are and whether they are of Arab background. We know that many of, uh, or you know, the very small and, 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 uh, and minuscule Bahraini Jewish community originally is Iraqi, and I suspect of those in, 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 in the UAE also of, who are of Arab background, those Jews who are of Arab background, come from Iraq originally. Uh, clearly, they have not been uh, Zionists, but there's an attempt to Zionize them, the attempt to set up synagogues, dispatch uh, uh, you know, Ashkenazi rabbis, uh, etc., and to link them to Israel. Again, uh, as I was saying in the previous uh, 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 sort of uh, response, that the idea that Jews are uh, necessarily pro-Israel or that they would support it automatically uh, is what Israel pushes for. The fact that a majority of Jews historically opposed Zionism and a majority of them began to support uh, uh, the cause of Zionism after World War II and after the Holocaust did not mean that they became Zionists. They became pro-Zionist, even though they were anti-Zionist previously. Um, now, I, you know, I, I do not know, uh, given the small numbers of uh, Jews who live in the Gulf today, 
what their views on Israel uh, may or may not be. It seems to me they may be like uh, uh, other Arab liberals who have become very friendly to Israel. I mean, some of them could be that. So if they are pro-Israel or friendly toward Israel, they would be no more or no less than their Muslim compatriots. Um, uh, so if they have become pro-Zionist, they would be as pro-Zionist as pro-Zionist Muslim Arabs. Uh, who also may live in the Gulf and support the recent uh, turn to uh, f you know, friendship with Israel. And if they oppose it, they would also oppose it you know, from uh, uh, an anti-Zionist perspective that they may share with their Muslim compatriots. Um, the purpose of this, of course, is to co-opt them by Israel if they have not been co-opted or are not co-optable. Now they can be uh, uh, co-opted. Um, but the idea of Jewish self-determination is one that could only be exercised according to the Zionists in Israel itself. Remember, previous to that, I mean, the Zionists initially were much more uh, uh, democratic about the target country where the Zionist colonization would take place. Um, even the Zionist uh, uh, organization itself initially was committed to Argentina, but then entertained the possibility of Kenya, which at the time was called Uganda, as a possibility. But then you have, by 1905, you have the Zionist uh, territorial organization, which explored other areas, including Australia, South America, uh, Turkey, Cyprus, uh, Iraq uh, and other areas. So uh, uh, they called also for some form of Jewish colonization and presumably if they if those projects had uh, been successful for what they might have called Jewish self-determination in these areas. But as it stands, uh, Jewish self-determination can only be uh, exercised and must be exercised and unique to Jews in the land of Israel. Um, as for the Jews of, of the Gulf, they probably would be targeted like the Jews of France or the U.S. by Israel's leaders who often call upon them to quote-unquote come home to your homeland. Uh, a kind of call that if any uh, 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 European or American Christian leader would make would rightfully be called anti-Semitic because, because they would be denationalizing U.S. Jews or, or uh, French Jews. So it seems to me uh, the leaders of the Gulf might take offense if Israeli leaders in the future would call upon the Jews of the Gulf to come home because if they are uh, uh, Gulf nationals and clearly they are, then they are already at home. And uh, the, the Israelis, uh, in that sense, would be trying to subvert them into making, into denationalizing them and inviting them home. But um, I, I have not yet heard of a specific call to Gulf Jews to come home by Israeli leaders. Uh, you know, if, if you've heard of some, please let me know. I can't hear you, Rami. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. We have a couple more questions. So this question is uh, from uh, Leith Maruf. So the Crusaders also said they are the descendants of the apostles. Thus, they have right to Palestine and to rule Jerusalem. Is Zionism, is Zionism just another face of the eternal urge of white supremacy to colonize not only the land, but also the heritage of Arabic peoples and their ancestors, like uh, Christianity and Judaism, and to dress up and play, pretend he might or claim to be the embodiment of Christian Jewish heritage, as they would put it. Okay, I'm confused because uh, the, the question seems to have come from a Gretchen King. Yes, but but it's it says a question from Leif Maruf. So okay. I'm assuming that Gretchen is passing on this question from... Regardless, uh, I'll answer the question. I know the Crusaders do not see themselves as descendants of the apostles, not at all. The problem with European Christians, of course, is that, you know, as converts to this Palestinian religion, uh, the Crusades begin, of course, about 50 years after the split in the church between the Catholic Church and between what becomes the Eastern Roman Empire and the Eastern Church. Uh, so the idea was that these European converts to Christianity realized that they were actually beholden to a religion uh, whose geography and whose history is not under the rule, but under the rule of people whom they consider to be uh, heretics. Remember, uh, the Crusades would also sack uh, uh, Constantinople on their way to uh, to Jerusalem. 
uh, because it was uh, at the time ruled by Eastern Christians. Um, and remember, Jerusalem at the time was uh, uh, had a majority Arab Christian population, and Palestine itself uh, probably had more than half of, uh, its population was Christian at the time, even if ruled by uh, Muslims. Um, so the, the European Christians weren't wanted to actually appropriate uh, the very geography on which their faith was based. Uh, and remember, for Palestinian Christians, I, I always make this uh, remark, um, for Palestinian Christians, you know, they, they come from Nazareth, from Bethlehem, from Jerusalem. Uh, the important towns and cities of the uh, Christian stories of, of the scriptures are living towns and cities where they come from. Uh, uh, you know, Palestinian Christians always wonder, I think, how these European Christians could believe in our folk religion. Uh, after all, this would be equivalent to a Palestinian Christian believing in a Christ who was born in Paris, raised in London, and crucified in New York, which would be something so strange. Um, yet, of course, uh, uh, the adoption, uh, and I think that strangeness for uh, 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 European Christians was registered, hence the importance of taking possession of the geography of Palestine uh, through the Crusades. Um, so in that sense, uh, they did not uh, uh, claim necessarily descent, or, or, or some might have, uh, uh, you know, of the apostles who had uh, gone to the Roman Empire to uh, proselytize. Uh, but the point is that the Jews of the time were, you know, were, were not interested in this project. Remember, the Crusades killed Jews, Muslims, and Eastern Christians en route to their takeover of Palestine at that time. Uh, what revived the Crusader interest, remember there were Crusader campaigns that continued for the next three, four centuries till the 15th century. By then you have the Protestant Reformation. It is a Protestant Reformation that revives the interest in Palestine and the Hebrew Bible, and uh, who insists that uh, through its millenarian uh, transformation that European Jews should be converted to Christianity and returned to uh, the land of their ancestors, allegedly. Um, and it took another 300 years for a Jewish movement to adopt that view after Jews had, of course, opposed this uh, uh, Protestant view of themselves. So, um, uh, and remember the 19th century, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, the, the new crusade was of a, what, what, what was called the peaceful crusade uh, by the British evangelicals was about European Christians and American Christians coming to settle in Palestine. The early, of course, colonists were uh, American evangelicals who came in the 1840s and set up uh, uh, several colonies in Jaffa and elsewhere. Then you begin to have also German uh, evangelicals, the Templars, who arrive also in the 1860s and set up about eight colonies uh, through the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you have uh, another, you know, uh, Chicago evangelical family, the Spaffords, who come and set up a colony in Jerusalem. They, they buy a house uh, uh, that was built by a member of the Husseini family outside the uh, uh, walls of Jerusalem. Uh, it becomes the basis of their colony. They are joined by Finnish uh, from Finland, uh, evangelicals at the time, uh, uh, and they continue to live in Palestine, you know, for the next, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, two thirds of a century. As you might know, uh, uh, today, the so called American Colony Hotel in Jerusalem is called that because that is the house that they bought from the Husseini family and became their American colony. So, in fact, most of the colonists who came to Palestine at the beginning and in the middle of the 19th century up to the 1870s were actually Christians. Um, and the movement by British evangelicals, especially those who set up in 1908 uh, of the London Society for the, promo for the promotion of Christianity amongst the Jews, they're the ones who would begin to actually further this uh, project. Um, they would build uh, the first Protestant church in Jerusalem, the first such church, a Protestant church uh, in Jerusalem or under the Ottomans, and they would uh, begin a project of converting German Jews to Christianity. Even London at the time, or Britain at the beginning of the 19th century, had no more than 8,000 Jews. Um, uh, and as a result, you begin to have an interest in uh, converting uh, German Jews. Um, so uh, the first uh, bishop, 
of uh, the Anglican Church in Palestine who arrives in the early 1840s was in fact a German rabbi who was converted to Anglicanism, becomes a bishop in Britain, and is dispatched on a British military frigate to Jerusalem to take over the first Protestant church in the city that the British built. And the idea was that uh, having converted Jews would be uh, more uh, uh, more amenable to attract more Jews to convert to Christianity and come to Palestine to expedite the second coming of Jesus Christ. Excellent. Wow. Okay. okay. So uh, I have a question from uh, uh, Laura. So that uh, could you please talk? Uh, thanks, Professor Massad. Could you please talk more about the hijacking of anti-colonial rhetoric by Zionist colonists? You mentioned it grew with decolonization movements in post World War II, but this, but did this rhetoric exist from the founding of Zionism or pre World War II? Was Jewish self determination also seen as anti colonial? Um, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, no, of course, it was always the, the language was always colonial to set up colonies, colonial, you know, colonization, colonialism. Indeed, uh, uh, at the time, um, I mean, remember the idea of Jewish colonialism uh, or colonization uh, begins uh, uh, in the 18th century. Uh, during the French Enlightenment, you have the beginning of political economy, what we used to be known as the physiocrats. The physiocrats begin to insist that only agriculture and land should be a source of wealth or of productive uh, uh, economic uh, uh, work. Uh, they were seen as anti-Semitic because many Jews in France at the time were traitors. But these ideas would be taken up by Catherine the Great, the German Tsarina of Russia, who was very interested in the Enlightenment and used to correspond with Voltaire and with some of the physiocrats. And she begins a project to alleviate the poverty of the Jewish communities of the Pale of Settlement, that area of Western, uh, or, uh, uh, Western Poland, Western Ukraine, Eastern Poland, and Lithuania, where Jews lived and to which they had been uh, uh, mostly relegated to live uh, under Catherine the Great. She begins the project of pro productivizing, what she called the productivization of Jews by moving them to settle in agricultural colonies in the newly uh, occupied Ottoman areas uh, of northern, the northern Ottoman Empire, what today is known as southern Ukraine or the Crimea, where she would set up agricultural colonies for them and send uh, German colonists to actually teach them agriculture. The idea that agriculture is a way out for uh, people out of poverty, especially for the Jews, would begin to be adopted by Jewish intellectuals uh, in Eastern and Western Europe, but especially by the Jewish bourgeoisie of Western Europe. The rich uh, class of Jews of Western Europe uh, were increasingly concerned about poor European Jews moving westwards um, and thought that the best way to help them is by setting up actually agricultural colonies for them around the world. So this begins to happen in the, you know, in, in the 1870s and 1880s. They begin to invest in agricultural colonies. They buy land even for them in Palestine, but also in Turkey and Cyprus and elsewhere, but mostly in the Americas. The Jewish Colonization Association is set up uh, as a non-Zionist uh, organization just to set up Jewish agricultural colonies in Argentina, Brazil, and the U.S., here nearby in New Jersey, to set up agricultural schools uh, to teach Jews farming because they had been barred from owning lands in certain parts of Eastern Europe. So the idea that rather than fight for their rights, even to be farmers within uh, uh, the rubric of the countries and empires within which they lived, the idea of uh, immigrating and colonizing other places uh, had become very current, especially as with the agricultural and industrial malaise that led to starvation across Europe after uh, the middle of the 19th century with the Irish, you know, over a million of them dying and millions uh, going to the US, you begin to have similar exodus of European, poor, poor European Jews from Eastern Europe and of Italians, right? All leaving the agricultural land that had been privatized through the end of feudalism and the introduction of liberal capitalism 
millions of these people begin to come to the Americas. So this is part of the, so the idea of immigrating and colonization was part of the culture of Europe at the time. So the European and Jewish intellectuals and rich philanthropists did not get the idea out of nowhere. Uh, but also the idea that agriculture would help alleviate poverty would become important. And this is the way uh, 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 it was set up. The Zionists, of course, had a, a related but separate project. Not only did they want colonization to be specifically in Palestine or in Argentina, but they wanted to set up a state around it, a, na a nation state. The original Ukrainian Jewish colonists who came through the Hovivay Zion, the lovers of Zion, were also agricultural colonists. They were interested in reviving Hebrew or whatever, but they were not really interested in having a state as such. The Zionist uh, uh, organization set up in 1897 would further this. So colonization was and colonialism was very much part of the story. Uh, by the nine, in the mid 1930s, there's some worry as the anti-colonial trends in India and in Algeria and elsewhere are ongoing. You begin to see Zionist officials saying perhaps we shouldn't use the word colonization uh, because especially if we're claiming that Jews are returning home, you don't colonize your own home. Uh, so they began an effort to change that language, but they really did not. It would be only in the 1950s and 60s where ideologues and defenders of Israel would begin to speak, as, and actually even later in the 70s and 80s, would begin to speak of the so-called independence of Israel in the same sentence as the independence of Ghana or the independence of India. Uh, so this is, this is very, very late in the game to kind of appropriate the language of anti-colonialism. Remember, Israel, of course, was not invited and did not seek to be invited to the Bandung Conference in 1955. Uh, although, of course, uh, uh, Nehru, uh, not very committed to the rights of the Palestinians, uh, wanted to invite Australia, South Africa, and Israel, but the Indonesians, of course, and the Egyptians uh, objected, uh, as did many Africans at the time, uh, to that suggestion. Um, so Israel and South Africa remained outside of the purview of the anti-colonial movement and continued to be condemned by it, which is, of course, uh, the culmination of which was in 1975, when the General Assembly passed the resolution that equated Zionism with racism. Um, so, but we see the effort to indigenize the colonists more recently. Now you see in New York, uh, you know, young uh, activists committed to Israel wearing a blue and white Palestinian kofia, meaning in the Israeli and in, 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 in the colors of the Israeli flag, um, and so, so that they're actually indigenous and not colonists. This is very new and you know mostly fake. Uh, because you know Zionism in its history does not deny what you know it, what the project was about. Right? So I hope that helps. Thank you. Let me wrap up with uh, a little, uh, with a, with a, with a last uh, question. But uh, I want to ask you to uh, just um, try to answer concisely to it because we're running out of time. Uh, so is it appropriate to acknowledge? And that's a question by Walid who has already posed the question, so that's the second question. Uh, is it appropriate to acknowledge that Jews, like any self-defined group, have the right to self-determination in theory, but the exercise of the right in Palestine is decidedly racist and colonialist, and he has no objection for them to exert the right on the moon? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I mean, it depends on which Jews, of course, East European Jews, uh, were arguably a people in the sense that they were they, they lived next to each other. They spoke a Jewish language called Yiddish, which in Yiddish means Jewish. They followed a faith that's called Jewish. Um, they had similar traditions and a similar history. So uh, self-determination for them, uh, uh, of course, is indeed their right. Although uh, um, neither the Zionist movement nor actually uh, the Bund, which was the most important uh, socialist uh, Jewish movement uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, called for self-determination. They called for cultural rights, but not for land self-determination, mostly because, of course, uh, the East European Jews, even though they lived in the Pale of Settlement, they didn't live there alone, that their uh, villages and towns were separated by the towns of also Russian or Polish-speaking uh, Christians, uh, but of course, uh, no, no, absolutely. The, 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 but of course, you know, how, how would uh, 
uh, a Polish Jew and a Yemeni Jew exercise of the exercise of determination together uh, is an impossibility since they actually are not part of the same group unless you accept the anti-Semitic notion that all Jews around the world are the same race and come from the same blood, etc. Uh, so, uh, uh, but yes, uh, uh, I mean today uh, Israeli Jewish colonists. Uh, and their descendants in Palestine uh, presumably have a right to self-determination as Israeli Jews in Palestine, but they don't have an exclusive Jewish right of self-determination in the land, right? So, um, uh, uh, so this is here the question. Um, and of course, you know, I have uh, uh, I have written extensively that self-determination itself is actually imposed by colonialism as a colonial right. It begins the way it's propagated by Wilson after World War One, and uh, uh, subsequently is to grant more rights to settlers and colonists rather than to natives. Uh, it only has its heyday and the revival of the Leninist. Uh, 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 right, which supports indigenous rights between 1960 and 1970 at the United Nations. The U.S. adds what it's called a safety clause to the principle and right of self-determination at the U.N., which exempts uh, people who uh, or, or countries whose people want to exercise self-determination from giving them independence and that self-determination becomes only, according to the United Nations, the exercise of your cultural rights and identity rights. But you cannot separate from the country under which you live and you, can, you will not be able to have lands restored to you. So uh, uh, self-determination has been emptied of much of what it's, you know, it had meant by Lenin in uh, the teens. And uh, uh, after 1970, the U.S. made sure that it would not accrue any land or property to the oppressed, which is why in 2007, the United Nations issued the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, in which it made sure that natives or indigenous peoples in the Americas, Australia, or elsewhere, cannot uh, separate, uh, get independence and separate from the settler colonies within which they live, and they have no right to the lands to be restored to them. They, they have the right to call themselves, you know, Maori, to have cultural rights and language rights, which is why the Israelis began to grant this to the Palestinians since the 70s. Israel has no problem saying the Palestinians now are a nation, fine, they share the same culture, etc. But that does not mean they have rights to their lands. Some of them may have rights to some lands, those are those who live in Gaza and in the West Bank, but uh, not all of them, and we will decide what lands they can have a right to and what lands they have no right to. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Massad. Joseph, thank you. Uh, and uh, Gretchen King uh, is also thanking you on the chat. Thank you for this lecture and discussion next time in Beirut in person. And we have had this discussion, you and I, and, uh, and uh, with dinner uh, at the Kiso. I am happy to extend that invitation <laughs> again to you, hoping to fly you in. Uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, Joseph, for your time. And uh, thank you for the audience, for those uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful questions that uh, you have posed. Uh, I mean, the lecture was fascinating, but the engagement after the lecture and the questions themselves, that was another, you know, another lecture of its own right. I would remind you that this lecture, this, this, this uh, uh, has been taped uh, and that it will be available for those of you who would like to share it with uh, those who are not able to make it today. We have received uh, a f several uh, queries about that and it will be posted uh, and advertised on our social media. Thanks again, Joseph, uh, for, for, for your wonderful presence. Thank you, Rami, for hosting me and for the uh, uh, Sandra for hosting me and thank you all for joining us. Uh, you and, have a... uh, I wanted to also say, by the way, 